your name or fix your camera, by all means, please do so. This thing is just taking a sweet time. See me how you're gonna have stand up, you're welcome too. Perfect. Uh if you wanna sit, it's whatever you feel comfortable doing. Okay, thanks. And then that okay. I just throw me and just walk up what? over there right? oh, come on. What do you mean it's private? No, oh, whatever. Hi, Miha. Hi, Asia. Come in. Hi, how are you? All right. Let me see if Tango's here. Tango's going first. Oh. I just got a new book, so I can put this in. Oh, all right, all right. Tango's not here yet. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Leo. Misael. Uh, I'm gonna pin myself just because. Hey, okay, there we go. How you doing? I'm good. You know, I was just crying because somebody bashed our windshield yesterday. And uh, it was just a lot to deal with, you know. Hey, Miha, did you see anybody else downstairs? Um, no, you know what? I didn't stop by the six floor. Because you remembered, because you're a great student. Tango, Miha, are you here yet? Let me text Tango real quick. No, you two, I can stop by. Please do. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Awesome? Oh, cool, cool, cool. All right, good. Good to see you, Leo. We're just going to wait just a tiny bit. Tom was probably a little sleep deprived because he's got a three month old. It's adorable watching him. He was teaching her how to play the guitar because he's really into guitar playing too. And she was like plucking, plucking the guitar strings. I'm like, wow, that little baby's going to be advanced. And he was, uh, he took her to a recording um, of a poem. And she was in the studio with him. And I'm like, damn. You know? I'm going to turn this up. Uh, see, we don't have a wire this, unfortunately. Turn that down. Okay. We'll just wait a couple of minutes. Tom, are you not on you? Are you? Looks like he's not. Usually he's pretty good. He's also on California time, so. Yeah. You want to sit over here so they can see you? Yeah. Or yeah, ¿cómo quieres hacer? ¿Quieres pararte o quieres sentarte? Ah, sí, porque tienen cuántos personas? Cuatro. Cuatro. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna have you go there, but they can see you. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, the tongue tongue who wants to come first is running a little bit late. Yeah. Um. So this is. Oh, anyway, let, I'll just start. My name is Dr. Jesus Estrada. This is the um the the final event. We had some beautiful events throughout the semester. I know people think I favor horror. It's kind of true, <laughs> but um we are going to have more events this summer. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, there's going to be, uh, I'm having Joseph Sale and um, Ross Jeffrey, who was, um, he was uh, a finalist in the Bram Stoker, which is a big deal in the horror industry. He'll be speaking via Zoom because they're coming from England. And then uh, I might have another another writer, but then in the fall, I'm going to have more events. And this semester was, was a lot. Um, I had maybe two every month. But uh, just a huge pleasure to have some of these poets here. And so um, I'm just going to briefly introduce them and have them say more about themselves. The order is going to be, um, I guess, and I'm not the one, I was going to have you go last, but since you're new to HWC, oh, never mind, here comes Tango. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of Tango's. Everybody knows I have a huge crush on him. But uh, anyway, so, so we have Ananda uh, Lima, who is a Brazilian poet. She's going to be reading. And also Tango Yusin Martin, who is the eighth, San Francisco poet laureate and just a just phenomenal phenomenal writer. Uh, let me see. This Zoom is being wonky though. Give me a moment, Tango. I'm gonna spotlight you because Tango's. I'm just gonna spotlight all the speakers that's outside so you can see their beautiful faces. Let me add you. And then uh, we also have Misael Juarez, who is the author of My Spoken Word Wife, who is just an amazing poet and performer. And whoa, I like it, brother. I like your background. And we have also the honor of having Canadian poet John Drudge, who writes about travel. And I, it would be really groovy if y'all gave him some feedback in terms of his performance. Um, he really is fantastic and also is into a lot of awesome hobbies. If you all could say a little bit more about yourself, but we're going to kick it off with Tom. How you doing, brother? You sleep deprived? Very. <laughs> Very sleepy. <laughs> oh, she wants to. So she's gonna go ahead, brother. You're you're on stack first. 
Um, and Tango may not be here for the full time. So we're gonna break up the program a little bit. Usually the speakers perform for about 10 minutes um, and then we do a Q and A. So why don't we have Tango go first and we'll go by maybe about five minutes of question and answers and then go to the next poet and divvy it up like that. And then towards the end, have some more Q and A. How does that sound? Does that sound all right? All right, Chevette, go ahead, Tango. I go to the um, railroad tracks and follow them to the station of my enemies. A cobalt tooth man pitches pennies at my mugshot negative. All over the United States, there are toddlers in the rock. I see why everyone out here got in the big cosmic basket and why blood agreements mean a lot and why I get shot back at. I understand the psycho-spiritual refusal to write white history or take the glass freeway. White skin tattooed on my right forearm. Ricochet sewers near where I collapsed into a rat-infested manhood. My new existence is living graffiti. In the kitchen with a lot of gun cylinders to hack up. House of God in part, no cops in part. My body brings down to Christmas. The new bullets pray over blankets made from the old bullets. Pray over the 28th hour's next beauty mark. Extrajudicial Confederate statue restoration, the waistband before the next protest post. Hey, by the way, um, time is not in losing, Your Honor. I will save your death for last. You're with it, Your Honor. You're moving money again, Your Honor. It's only raining one thing, uh, nine white cops. And prison guard shadows reminded me of spoiled milk floating on an oil spill. A neighborhood making a lot of fuss over its demise, a new lake for a Black Panther party. Malcolm X's ballroom jacket slung over my son's shoulder, the figment of village. A new news to a new white preacher, all in an abstract painting of a president. Ball saved us some time, didn't it? The tantrum screeches of military boats in election Tuesday cars. A cold blooded study in leg irons. Proof that some white people have actually found of nooses. That sundown couples made their vows of love over an opaque peach plastic and boat action audiences. The Mega Ever Second is definitely my favorite law of science, final news clippings, and primitive Methodists. My arm changes imperialisms, simple policing versus structural frenzies, elementary school script versus even wider white spectrums, artless bleeding in the challenge of watching civilians think. Terrible rituals they have around the corner. They let their elders beg for public mercy. I'm going to go ahead and sharpen these kids' heads in the arrows myself and see how much gravy spills out of family crest, modern fans of war, with their t-shirt poems. And t-shirt guilt. And me having on the cheapest pair of shoes on the bus, I had no choice but to read the city walls for signs of my life. I mean, all street life, to a certain extent, starts fair. Sometimes, with a spiritual memory even. pre dawn soul clap, your father dying even. Maybe I pushed the city too far. My my sensitivities to landfill districting and menstrual whistles, white supremacist graffiti on westbound rail guards all overcoming. Reauthored, reauthored by revolutionary violence that chose its own protagonist of muted stage of genius. The garbage is going voices. Condensed Marxism for warrior depressives. Underpasses in their pockets because they just might be deities a decent bit on the panther neck. A merciful Marxism. Disquieted home life for a metaphor for relaxing next to a person who is relaxing next to a gun. I stared at my father for a few seconds then returned to my upbringing. Uh, return to the souls of Ohio black folk. You know, re re revolution down there, pegging at this one. You know what the clown wants? The respect of the ant. Wants to interpret pain only. Wants to pull a 38 out of a begging bowl. Wants me to hurt my hand on this pen. I'm not tired of these rooms. Just tired of the world to give them a relativity. My only change of clothes prosecuted, the government finally learned how to write poems. Shootouts that briefly aligned. That make up a parable or parables like white bodies are paid well. Do white men even have leaders? Are all white people white men? A rat pitches a river, can almost taste the race of divide, can almost roll a family member's head into a city hall. Legislative chamber knows who in this good book will fly. I mean, all I do is practice, Lord. Decide not to talk out of anger ever again. Met my wife at the same time I met new audience members for our pa we pass each other cigarettes and watch cops win. A city gone uniquely linear. Harlem of the West, do it to a universe. I'll always remember you in fancy clothes, my wife said. So here I sit, twisting in self ideation. You know, rifle made a post bell and tar. Targets made of honest knives. You know, this San Francisco poetry is how God knows it is me whining. Riding among the lesser respected wolves, less observed militarization. Dixie List Prison Bookkeeping. I mean, the California Great Coast are coming. This mob gossip and bourgeois debt collection is tempting to change Professor Smith poem. In the Chicago briefing, the white sergeant saying, blank slate for all of us after this black organizer is dead. 
standard academics, toasting two buck wine at the tank parade, man, bay of nothing, Lord. Just, just nuclear cobblestones, gun line, athleticism, and the last of the inherited asthma. Children giving white dogs to play with and fear. Facial expressions borrowed from rich people's shoestrings. I can hear hate and teach hate and call tools by people names and name people dead to themselves. No one getting naturalized except federal agents soon. Carbon equator in the throat. So, I mean, I'm sorry to make you live all this. Lord, all this pre monarchy friends putting up politicians posters and snorting and made it a pace. Mr. Smith shoving it to the walls by the elders. My children sharpening quarters on the city's ears. For these audiences, I project myself into a ghost-like state. For these gangsters, I do the same. Every now and then, take a nervous look east. Sleep becomes Christ. Sleep starts going to racial identity. Do you have a spiral, Lord? Has the gang age betrayed us? Be patient with my palms, Lord. I, you know, so much pain is a point to crime. I mean, it has to be if race traitors come with it. Lord, is that my revolver in your hand? You know, better presence than these of yon the cages have called us holy slaves. Fill the school libraries with cop documentaries. Baby, I don't have money for food. Why? I don't have a present moment at all. These little societies, they wander together like hopeful drops of a virus. Citizen testaments bent on offering me a nation of breadwinners to hold me back. Like it's a Brinks. I wrinkle the concrete, sometimes like flesh. My Martin Luther King permanence turned away from a podium into the reeds like God is the dangerous twin. Black August to the mountaintop balcony on my bedroom floor. You know, they steal you from the earth itself and suspend you and your broken neck from their foolish euphoria. From the loyalty out to their gray superstition, loyalty out to their agrarian reform. I return to my mother completely disrespected for peeling the heat off of purgatory. They kill poets like me. Walk me away from my poems, never to be heard from again in this final industrial complex where bloodlines picked over, picked through, a sporting spiritual death or your devil at least half made. Police become a pretty word. I'm reading a lynch mob shoestrings like they were tea leaves teaching you how to write about cities. It's the 25th century in the mirror, people. Tyranny against your chump change, your chump to be mocked even with a gun in your car. A cubit of needlework spelled tune for the proletariat, the relapse ministry. Down to people curled up in a fetal position next to a diamond dime. Just another service day in the theatrics of tea house fascism. And a bouquet of surveillance cameras in the poverty of God. New blue eyes, man, courses of water. Uh, maybe a newly potted presidency. <laughs> or one big shiny coin if you ask an animated capitalism, another non-literal boy killing his white freedom. The deification of hyphens. Medicine bread and pictures shows. Great protesters in L.A. Guests of our ink. Drop kicking roses in the graveyard. This D.C. mink like a stone torn in half. The pen advances despite CIA guide polls, despite Non-African past and futures, a metaphorical but not surreal day in the horn in life. Horn player improvising king, like a radio price fight featuring Shango himself. A real hand sweeps the land of racism. Now return to the ground. Now make progress with the gun. My mother Emmanuel, they put on music that evening. A swinging type body language for you to drink with fermented $5 bills. For your body language, some applause. My past stomach lining. Neither a good thing. You know, a bad thing, like being psychic on the way to a lethal injection. It'll sit you down with Lady Day. Lady Day leading you to surrender their souls to Africa too soon. Polity thought floating in the cup of water, she saved me. Accessing my stomach. Accessing the love of the American lynch. Coast leaves wooden avalanche into the wrist. Our mother Emmanuel avalanche into the sharp keys pain. Or the fucking deal you make with pain. A piano makes sense for them. Lay hands on the world gradually. Addressing the bend of necks on the streets of the north. Traveling sailing in pain. Repeating pain in the north. Ten trigger fingers on that piano if harmony would have me. Putting a hundred fights on every direction off of her. 80 day. Uh, leaning on trees again. Recruiting the countryside itself. Saying, uh, lay your plan out on this lightning. Make your pawns a corner pocket of men. I greeted the blues itself. America may clean my dead body but will uh, never include me. There goes the poet. Killing without killing. And never mind this little painting of your language. 
May I be a meaningful lynching, a crow's passing, good and dead by the afternoon. Woo! Damn, yeah. <laughs> right on. <clears throat> Beautiful. I don't know if I mentioned Tango is the A San Francisco Poet Laureate and uh, just a beautiful all around human being. Um, it's always an honor to have you. So if you feel uh, confident, you can unmike. And were you done, brother? I'm sorry. I just love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was okay. it on the dot. Hey, how yeah. much time do you have? You got a, you got a. I uh, got, I got like, I got like seven minutes. All right. Super quick question for Tango. <laughs> He's got to go to work. Uh, students who are present or in the chat. Uh, I don't know if they can hear you, Miha, or I can repeat the question. Okay, I was just going to say, um, well, firstly, that was beautiful, uh, beautifully written, nice. beautifully performed. Um, it was very powerful, and it's just, it was very, I don't know, reminiscent of a lot of, uh, like, poets that I've read in the 70s and sort of during, like, the Black Power Movement. It just felt very strong. Ooh, did uh, you hear that? She said the sound, it reminded her of the Black Power Movement and uh, poets that she's read in the 70s. Yeah, it was just very reminiscent of that to me. Like, it, it remind, I've been reading a lot of um, um, Angela Davis lately, so it just felt very in line with a lot of her ideology. And um, I just wanted to say, how um, how long does it generally take for you to sort of get in the groove of, of getting comfortable with a certain, like, rhythm of a poem and, and doing it? Because I know it is perform, you know, a bit performative and you have to really get into it. Um, do you have, like, do you struggle a lot coming up with some of these, like, longer pieces, or does it come more naturally to you? Did you get that question? She wants to know how it, long it, 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 Yeah, go it, ahead. It, it, uh, speaking to the writing or to the reciting? Uh, to the writing. Um, so, yeah, man, you know, the, the trippy thing is, um, I, I really did kind of take at least a leap and a bound and a half when I uh, kind of learned that for me or for a, a period of time, the best way to write was to write bored. See, um, you know, when we have kind of a knack, then like, you know, you have the kind of the dances with catharsis or the dances with euphoria or the idea of a zone or you know, uh, all all these other really uh, uh, kind of like almost like visualizations or visualization of feeling or codification of feeling that will that actually will for me kind of would have me tunneling um, and not seeing as much um, both in the in, in whatever the given investigation was. And also not seeing as much as in the potential to kind of uh, the, the potential of a line to, to find more dimension in these, you know, like to uh, to, to, to find more uh, uh, kind of uh, patterns or, or expand the dimension and color of the line. Um, and so and, it, and I did it inadvertently. It, it was basically just I just challenged myself to write for longer periods of time. And in that, taking myself out into that deep end, I found that it was impossible at a certain point to write with a full head of steam, right? Or to be in some kind of zone. After a while, especially when you're kind of out of shape, pen-wise, um, you just land in this place of just like, not cynicism, but, you know, uh, uh, it, kind of, it gets kind of blasé because it's like, okay, whatever, let me just get to the next line, the next line. But interestingly, it was in that section of the kind of a writing session that I noticed I was gaining more and more lucidity of craft or clarity of craft. So the approach for a long, 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 long time was to not try to accomplish anything. And really, because really, you know, it is like, you know, this reality or you have you don't you don't need to stir up power. You just need to relax and you actually have like relax, kind of dim your own, your personal uh, ambition or vendettas. Turn that down as much as possible. And you actually have access 
to an incredible amount of power and uh, retribution. You know, what I'm <laughs> so, so so it's like you know, um, kind of turning off turning off the light in a room to find out the sun is out. You know what I'm saying? Um, really is is, is really and then you know it it kind of it, it changed over time to where. As much as possible, I actually now try to place attention just on how I'm physically feeling literally in the moment, second to second, like just kind of keeping an uh almost just trying to stay present, more present with the actual pro process, even when it's not cerebral or the non cerebral experience of it, and then let let what what uh let what happens happens. But what might also be a helpful answer is to just learn how to get your craft to cooperate with the various ways you feel. That's when you find that kind of sweet spot where you really get to creating something super singular, super interesting, uh, because it's born of just like an actual, not just an honesty of mind, or, or as far not just an honesty of material, but also like an honesty of the moment. When you got that going, then so then everything actually becomes helpful. It can be used, you know what I mean? So you feel one way, shit, let that cough you up a, a different kind of voice or a different kind of style than you usually use, you know? Like, there's all kind of ways to just use what, you're what you literally have. So that, that's that's kind of my approach. Beautiful. Yeah. And Tango meditates. You took, I mean, I know you, it just, I was telling them you had a beautiful baby girl, you and your partner. Yeah. Um, do you still have time to meditate? Um. You know, not as like, well, yes, but it's just like things is different now. Like now I don't get to, you know, like, you know, y'all know the tortoise in the hair story. Yes. See, I used to be the hair, even though I don't move fast. Like and <laughs> you you probably wouldn't tell if you was around me because I'm pretty laid back. But as far as like kind of, you know, work or developing myself or cultivating myself i was very much like a hair like i do a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot and then don't do nothing and a lot a lot a lot a lot, lot don't do nothing but now that i'm on the little homie schedule it's like i have to basically constantly be looking for um time and play uh, time to, to cultivate myself so I, i'm the tortoise now and it's groovy <laughs> you know what i mean it, it works. It works. In fact, I probably written more since uh, since she was born. I I probably written more um, in this last Amazing. four months than I had the four months before she was born. Wow, that's beautiful. Well, Tango, we know you gotta get to work. We sure. Yeah, I gotta run. I gotta say All thank right, you, thank you, brother. Anything uh, you can always a pleasure to see you. Always. Much love. Much love. Give, solidarity. Give love to your family. Man. Amen, brother. All right. Free Palestine. You dig? Yes, yes. We'll talk about empire. We were the focus is actually empire and transition, and that was Tango's um, Tango proposed a team, and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And now with the conflict in Israel and uh, between Israel and Iran, I think it's more and more complicated and poses more danger for for many people. Um, so I don't know how much we're gonna hit the theme. I think we're really just gonna sink into these beautiful poems. And uh, um, I was gonna put you last, but you're a guest. Is that okay? Yeah. You know, all right, all right. Yeah. And you Either can turn one. your chair me if you want to. All right. Uh, Misa Arwadez has been here many, many times before. I don't know if you want to say a little bit about yourself um, and maybe read for, for like 10 minutes. And should we? I mean, we can save the questions for the end, too. I just wanted to give Tango some space. Uh, go ahead, brother. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to read to you uh, poems from my upcoming book, My Dream Catcher in the Ride. I'm reading new poems that you haven't heard before. Oh, and, what um, a treat. And I, you know, I just want to, I want to thank you all for coming here on time and being here with your lovely selves. I can't see you, but I can feel the presence, you know, just by Jesus reflecting off you guys and, and talking the way she does to you guys. I know she loves y'all. So with that, I'm going to read my new poem. Well, it's, it's been sitting on the, on the, on the files for a while. So I'll go ahead. The street blues is suit with guitars and melodies, sitting, speaking with his good friend, the sidewalk tree. Days are filled with white clouds drifting on memories. Spare a cigarette, he has so little money. Is the static hidden over concrete pavement. Makes him holler at cars passing by his street tent. 
He's occasionally yelled at back or honked at, raging crush aluminum can that's been kicked back. One day, he's seen an angel opening his eyes. She was working the shelters in the blue sky light, making them wonder how is he so far and close to a pretty bird that came caressing his soul. A homeless crew with the old school melody groove made a, a homeless crew with an old school melody groove made a drum out of bucket, sang hymns that were cool. He began to sing from the back of the lunch line, holding his tray while his verse unwind with fine time. It was a skid roll performance, noticed by a few. It was a skid roll performance, noticed by few. His boys accompany every word with blue hues. She smiled and served mashed potatoes on his lunch tray. Ladies like her deserve love every holiday. Oh, he rocked his body to the sound of his words, tipped his hat to an angle to look fancier. Nothing like an angel telling him to be strong. It was the last time that broke the slot machine song. His mind seems to see strange fiction and fairy tales. Ghost ships on Skid Row, Lincoln Park mermaids that sail. The shopping cart Jack Sparrow with a bald up fizz. But today he sings with shopping cart pirate bliss. She thanks him for his singing. She thanks him for his singing. Serves him a turkey slice. Adds gravy on top and says, rock the stage, it's nice. She says, let's organize an open mic Friday. He says, thank you for feeding us this holiday. I'm hungry. I'm hungry because I, had, I don't know about everybody else, man. All these visuals of the cafeteria. That, that's <laughs> different. That's a different more brother than your my spoken word wife. It's, it's, got, it's different. You know, it's yeah, different yeah. Writing, I, but the format is different. The, the, um, the, the, my spoken word wife was uh, centered around, uh, uh, female protagonists this one is centered around male protagonists i felt like the fellas were like saying like, how come how come you do this for them but you don't give us a clue about what to do with our lives so i just cool. wanted to like share these stories you know cool 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 all right sorry yeah. i didn't interrupt that was i i actually um uh, i should tell you more about it what time you you, you oh. you're gonna have to do my spoken word whack though i'm just saying all right go ahead hit it brother okay this one's called la jokers L.A. Jokers were baseball caps while laughing tough, never sweating the cops because life's always rough. It's like they have sec accepted their faith and destiny. They made things happen, even under scrutiny. Listening to oldies radio made them mellow, telling stories of crazy battles like old souls, drinking a beer, smoking a fresh rose cigarette, writing rhymes for beautiful girls to get at them. It takes a special teacher with more corazón than the standardized version for the low income. Schools aren't designed, designed for freedom-loving young men. Deuces are wild, but it only takes one of them. Walking L.A. streets is an adrenaline rush. It's important to know when and where to be hush. L.A. jokers were playing chit-chat with a few because you never know who's playing the pigeon stool. Once in a while, you run into wild-eyed loners, those filled with battle scars and chips on their shoulders. It could get messy depending on the wordplay. The fight is born when you see them as foe to slaves. But L.A. Jokers recognize mass street laughter. Let me read that again. But L.A. Jokers recognize mass street laughter. Knowing gang rivals are more about who's better. Never know when strangers will do you a favor. So think with compassion and not like a hater. Laugh abundantly while shit's going down in town. Sometimes others stop being scared because they're around. When you align street humor and cool playfulness, it makes you go harder to get through all the mess. In the end, having no shame for being unchained, Joker's dream they be taking out the old space game. This is for every Joker laughing their ass off. Nothing short of cool game calling the system bluff. All right, I'll jump into another one. Oh, my last one, you wanted to read one from the book, huh? Um, yes, I do. I love I'll all do it. But I'm digging this uh, few verses. Sorry, sorry, I'll shut up. Sorry. All right. So this is inspired by my homeboy who who's really smart, but his mouth gets him into trouble. So I wrote this poem for him. <laughs> when my homie calls, I'm ready to run the ground. A psychedelic ride with my homie through town. Shop to battle with nothing but words for advice. It's a homie's nature to seek game for the wise. 
from the wise. If you see the cops, don't run your mouth into court. Show them you're more legit more than ever before. It's thrilling to us. It's thrilling to outsmart them at the local stop. But it's better that you go unnoticed by cops. Just picture, if you will, what the old timer said. Being involved will make you understand the bet. We gamble with our life. That's why life's a hustle. Some chess pieces remain to still win new battles. If you choose a path, go where your heart is warmed up. The world is cold and deadly. Enough is enough. It was nice to blend in, but they do not like it. That cool war players are lyrical badasses. Yes, I hear the preacher. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I hear the preacher, but also see his grin. They think life is about satisfying rich men. My life skills keep improving with time and patience, even though I was given the street experience. If you hustle with hearts, then it was all a lie, like cheating with fixed eyes. That's when somebody dies. Being named a playboy, having dangerous fame, blazing in purple haze instead of purple rain. I'm counting on them to leave me out the old slums, but that's just plain dumb when money isn't alone. Flashy things to say never fly past the stadium, but a simple truth will carry you to freedom. When my big homie calls, I'm down to ride shotgun. Being our own fathers, they were gone with the sun. As little homies are rampaging when they're sick, big homies let them know when they're on some bullshit. <laughs> right. I love it. I love it. Well, I got the. Well, do I got time for one more? I, I would do uh, one more on my spoken word. I mean, what's the appetite? Because we got students in person and on Zoom. Do you want to wait till the end to ask questions, or do you want to ask questions after he's done? Oh, uh, I'll just ask questions in in the end because the end. all right, is that cool with y'all too? We just we keep okay. them entertained. Beautiful, I yeah. love it. Go ahead, one more, and then we'll go on to uh, on stack is uh, John. All right, so here's the book that. Can you see it? You can't see it. Okay. All right. So read from my spoken word wife. All right. She's a beautiful brown petite woman, bringing out my humor and wit full of wisdom. I'm speaking about the poetic body of goddess. She rules my heart and brings out loving comments. I'm inspired by her soulful loving nature, pleasing her with words to spell out raw danger. And writing about her bright world is easy. If you were filled with bright light, bringing her home to me. Yet sometimes the world spins like an oldie record. And she's a chola singing through stormy weather. I never surrender to her imperfection. I'm surrendering, surrendering to her will as a blessing. I penetrate the world with an infinite look. She purposely looks like a dork with a book. While I'm planting a tree in every neighborhood, making it up to nature for the paper she took. Her world is like a still soft and sweet melody. And like a detective, I solve a mystery. I'm on the edge of discovering my real gifts, seeing my destiny without the crucifix. I hold her hand and I get more respect. Forever feeling like this book is my mistress. I see her pain was never meant to be so, but like the river, she is owning true flow. She's the best hand I ever had, so place your bet. Playing my hand like every star depends on it. Her smoke protects me from evil grins, blowing smoke as I flip the wild aces to win. Living on the edge makes me dangerous as they give me as they give awards for making bold statements. I celebrate her style at LA open mics with this dedication to my spoken word wife. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's one of yeah. my favorites. All right. Well, we have the honor and privilege of having John Drudge all the way from Canada for the first time. And it's so good to see you and hear your voice. You, you're much, your voice is much younger, bro. I was like, who's this guy? <laughs> it's nice I to see like, you, too. Good, good. So, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a social worker by trade um, and an entrepreneur. So. I, I'm reading today from a, a book uh, that just came out, and it's a collection of, of travel destination poems. It's not terribly controversial. It's, um, you know, or poignant, but it's, it, I think what I tried to do is, is, and what I tried to do generally with writing is sort of 
pare down, you know, things to very basic sorts of things, very simple language, but try to express something very complicated. And, and I hope I've done that with some of these, but these are destination travel poems, mostly about love, um, some a little bit uh, more escape, but more, mostly about love. I wanted to start with the uh, first one called uh, A Skin Hunger. I write shorter poems as well, so they're not terribly long, so I'll probably go through a number of them. Um, this one is called Skin Hunger. With a hard wind roiling crests along the river and an irredeemable, unforgiven feeling pressing against the swell of the night's possibilities, he reached the little red jazz bar on the Rue de Hulachette and pushed through the doorway with the force of a thousand saviors and a blood feud of human vanity and the scarlet flush of a deep skin hunger. A lot of these take place in Paris, not all of them. I do go to other places in the world besides Paris, but I have spent a good bit of time there. Um, this one is called Drifting. Uh, across the reeds through the marsh by the bending willow in the clearing with the day breaking wishes on rocks and the creek in the distance where intuition, introspection and the ogling of regret turn up the volume on our most wandering thoughts. I dig it, Jack, it's beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this was a, a, a poem about getting out of Paris <laughs> um, with, with my family. We, the kids were young and, and I had my, uh, my, my mother-in-law with me and uh, we just needed to get out of Paris. It was getting to us. So we went to the coast and this is a poem about that. We took the train from Paris in the morning and reached the coast by afternoon. Nice was a welcome change from the hustle of the city. We drove the winding road from the station above the old town to the chateau where Romans once kept watch upon the shore. It was time to be one and to love. It was time to feel the world slow in the tower on the hill above the sea. Here's another one uh, about Paris. Um, my wife and I uh, have, have had a, a fair number of, of romantic times in Paris and they're not the sort of romance that you kind of think of when you think of romance in Paris. I find the romance in very simple sorts of things and, and just little memories, just little little experiences. And I try when I'm at a place or when I'm, I'm visiting a place or staying there for some time, I try to be in the moment of everything and just experience it uh, and try to reflect that back when I write. Um, this one's called The Cafe. Down to the Latin Quarter to the cafe by the store where you bought that green dress, where we locked our bikes to the street lamp and raced the rain to salvation, where the table was ours in our universe, away from it all, with everything nestled in where it belonged. This is a poem about Venice, actually, but um, it's called Harry's Bar. A lot of history in Harry's Bar, but there's still history going on in Harry's Bar, and sometimes you can be a part of it. The night was warm with a light wind blowing off the lagoon, down the narrow walkways, across bridges and over canals, through a thousand endings and beginnings where romance suffuses with the glow of one more story and the twists and turns of another Venice night, pushing through the crowds of St. Mark's across the square to Harry's Bar, where I saw beyond eternity for a moment that night and fell deeper in love with you. This one's called A Night in Florence. Do I have time for a couple more? Yeah, the class is over at 12.20, so maybe a couple more and then- uh, we'll Okay. Yeah. A Night in Florence. Beauty, humanity, and knowledge, a renaissance of ideals, a new age of learning and the winds of change grand visions of progress under a new Medici moon, and the elegant refinement of lurid need, lurid need in the Tuscan foothills, carnality and sin pressing against flesh as day turns to night with the deep undertones of Florence breathing. Uh, I'll read one more. Um, this is an, I, I got feedback on this once um, from someone uh, who said it was probably one of his favorite poems about the French Revolution. The problem was this isn't about the French Revolution and I never, <laughs> never thought of it, well, but I didn't correct him. I figured he, that, that's a good thing. There you go. Um, it's called That One Night. 
The deafening roar of a new black rain against the ignition of Paris at night, the fervent reflective flow of light on rainy boulevards, where imaginations run free and dance with bold dreams, blind to the subtle snicks of time and the unsteady winds on the horizon. Yeah, beautiful thank you. point, John. Oh, thank you. I'm, I've, I've never read in public before. Just uh, so that's you... why I, I wanted my students to really watch how you were performing so they could give you feedback. And the other poets can, too. We're on a group chat on Facebook. I know that's kind of a boomer place, but, you know, it's, it's a good place for writers. Um, and next, we have Ananda Lima. Did I get it right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to read from the podium. We're there. It's, it's up to you. Wherever it makes sense. How about the podium, Miha? Yeah, because the <laughs> mic may pick up better. I don't think anybody else is coming. Yeah, the is the mic. Oh, yeah. This is fun. Oh, John, that was beautiful. Everybody knows what beautiful poems, and I like how different they are and how mm -hmm. nicely they go together. So this is great. Does this work? The podium is good? This sounds good, right? This is good? Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So I'll read from... Um, um, I'll read from, oh, and thank you for having me. Hey, anytime, <laughs> anytime. And I'll read, uh, because we have Poetry Month and because of the theme, I'll read one longer poem. I also write short poems, but I'll read a longer one from my book, Motherland. Um, and then I'll, I'll, this is a fiction book, but I snuck some poetic stuff in there. So I'll, I'll read that too. <laughs> um, so this one, there's a couple of references. Uh, for this poem, one is that book that um, that mo cartoon movie Ice Age. You know yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That to me is terrifying. I never watch it because it's just way too much, <laughs> and I feel very bad for the squirrel thing or whatever. <laughs> so you know that that shows up in there. And the the other thing is um, there was a seed bank. It, it, there still is. There's a, a place where all the seeds are kept all over. Seeds that people f have from the world is like called the seed bank. Um, and at some point it was breached because of melting ice. Ooh. I think it was 2017 or something. Uh, so I wrote about that because it was a very sort of disturbing occurrence. Um, but I think they fixed it for now. So interesting. <laughs> so this one is called uh, In Flight Entertainment While the Doomsday Seed Bank is Breached. My son's face is blue with a soft light of ice age falling on his round cheeks. The voices in the animation contained by the cups of his child-sized earphones, muffled by the shush of turbans, so constant, so similar to the soothing sound of waves, we forget the aggression of their volume. On his screen, the body of a desperate little mammal is repeatedly crushed by gravity, rocks and metal, the creature still unable to reach the nut as its head smashed between two stainless steel plates, its eyes bulging out of their sockets. And my son laughs. He understands what is expected of him now. In this type of movie, there are always good guys who always win. When we walk in the dim uh, amber light in the Natural History Museum, surrounded by bones, we were told we were the sole survivors, the lonely branch of the human family tree because of a superb adaptability. And we chose to differentiate ourselves from the dead with a postfix, sapiens. The picture of the global seed vault in the Arctic made me think of architecture and the architect who said, a vida un sofro, life is a breath. At that speed, the floor of the poet's green room is damp, now wet, now water covers the wrought iron feet of the bed where she sleeps with her lover and water fills the natural history museum and we float above the tallest of bone structures our heads tilt against the ceiling as we drink from the mouth of a whale, the last sliver of air. And I hum and hold my son's hand and think of the cow carcasses in the drought cracked soil of the Northeast. The walls in China, Germany, Palestine, the barbed wire wall around my mother's condominium and the futile future walls sprout one after another in an accelerating stop motion video, then blur, 
then crumble. And soon, there'll be no need for green camouflaged uniforms. Gone will be the beautiful armament celebrated in the old news. Gone is music. Gone is the green of money and the green of poetry. Gone were the paintings and recordings in museums. Mathematics, gone, long gone have been architecture and those seeds in the abandoned coal mine in the Arctic. On the colorless surface of the moon, imprinted in its style of dust, undisturbed by wind or water, there will always remain a footprint. But for now, I turn my screen to a map of our journey, our airplane, tiny, surrounded by blue. Ooh, beautiful. That was the poem. I mean, damn, who don't know you could have gotten such richness from the Ice Age movie. You know that? That is amazing. That is gorgeous. Yeah, that one was like, thank you. Now I'll read from a fiction book, Sneaky in the Poetry. And the book, this passage is not so like, the book is full of the dystopic fields of the. Empire and transition, but this passage is more about the character's life. My character, she meets the devil and is good buddies with the devil. And this is one of the passages where she meets the devil again. And, and there's a it's almost like a very, very long sequence, almost like a sentence as the devil shows her her life. Mm. Okay. So years later, Peter is her husband. Years later, Peter and the writer went to the Met together. There they were at an exhibition when Peter had to take a call from work. He left the building standing by Cezanne's Mont Saint Victor and the Viaduct of Art River Valley. I can't speak French. <laughs> As she looked at the painting, the devil showed her how to find herself in it. Not the central tree interrupting the view or any of the other trees in the foreground. She was in the tranquil green landscape in the background, the valley, the mountains, the bridge. She was a brush stroke. The devil traced her, traced her through a yellowing green section of the grassy fields. Here was her birth, where the brush first touched the canvas. A minute moment, movement to the right, her as a young child, grabbing the spider, bringing it to her mouth. Her mother wrapping her in a blanket and lifting her. The car ride to the ER, her throat swelling with venom. The devil followed the grooves of the brush stroke and she hid the brown sofa and she hid behind the brown sofa in her aunt's library, waited for the sound of the door closing and stood, ran her fingers on the red leather bound covers. Here was the chalk breaking on the blackboard when she was called to write her answers. Here she was with that boy in the stairway to the basement of her building, his lips on her lap neck, the first time anyone's lips met her like that. Here was the long bus ride in the dark. Here was being caught in the rain, her socks and her hair soaked. Her shirt stuck to her body, her kicking a puddle for the splash. Here, her mother and aunts together peeling tiny shrimp for the bobo, karibu, and batapa. Here, her pinching out of chunk of cotton candy. A slight turn of the brush, her taking Peter's hand, leading him to that dark part of the garden at his friend's wedding reception. Here the night staring at her clock, the steady feeling of notebooks, back in the apartment, quitting her job and leaving the office at 10.30 a.m. The men cooking at the halal cart, pe people rushing to Penn Station, midtown moving as it always did as she walked away from it, into the lake at sunset, the orange water, cold crossing her belly button, her chest, dunking her head in, the silver speckled darkness of the water mixing with the sky as night fell. The devil skipped to another section of the painting where the grass met a curving path. He said he liked the aquamarine, how the aquamarine turned into a dark forest green, right here. He pointed and smiled. He turned his gaze away from the painting toward the entrance of the gallery. Peter walked in, the devil disappeared. Thank you so much. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. She said it's beautiful. Do you want to stay up there or you want to go inside? Either way, it's good. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions either in the chat or for any? And, and a, maybe, uh, uh, John, you forgot to say the title of your book. 
Oh, yes. Um, the book is called Sojourns. Look at that beautiful, beautiful. cover, beautiful and design. It's beautifully designed. <laughs> I designed it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Not the, not the graphics. Um, I'm very proud of that book because it looks beautiful. I tried to, uh, you know, in fiction, I love it when when writers have individual graphics, yeah, and yeah. so I tried to individualize the graphics for the books. We're, we're still working on it, you know. It's, but it's it is a beautiful book. Um, and I love it. Yes, and so my students, do you have questions for John or Misa or Amanda? I have a question for Should I start with you? Whomever you can just ask a question; and they can all answer it. Um, well, I guess for all of you, I wanted to start with, like, what are some of the things that inspire you for your different, like, respective genres? I know you all have different styles and different takes on poetry. What gives you sort of the drive to write something that you really feel connected to and that you feel like, yes, I want to include this in a book. I want this to be part of a collection. Could, did you get all that? <laughs> good mic. <laughs> That's good, right? Who wants to go first? I, I go ahead. There you go. <laughs> um, yes, that was a great question. I think it was a couple of things. Uh, I think um, the the awareness of what inspires you and is going to make it into some writing, I think it developed for me with time. Like before, I wouldn't know as much before I was halfway through writing, you know. Now I have this, some, some either phrases or images uh, they they sort of really buzz for me. I'm like, there's something there for me, yep. and I know I'll write about it, right? And um and I don't so much now worry about going like I'm going to now write about that thing. Um, I I keep thinking about it, and I know it's going to come out in one of the things <laughs> that I write. So I think I'm better at recognizing the spark now, mm -hmm. and it really is just being in touch with what moves you. Yeah. right as you look into the world and read what what it moves you and when you feel that tug i know that that thing is going to be productive for me. do you keep a notebook i do keep yes. a notebook and and i also like keep on my phone sometimes you know, i do the phone. <laughs> and the, the phone. Exactly. yes yes so you can like yeah Just, yep yeah. how about amisa and laura john what inspires yeah. you <clears throat> for me i think it um it often comes down to mood i try i try to stay open and and try to stay out of my way actually i just try to be part of the in the moment in the present and and things sometimes will just pop i'll get a word or or a sentence or or just as i'm looking at something something will come in and i, I go to my phone notes and and quite often if i stay in that space and i stay kind of open to experience really is what it is there's something that's happening that i don't quite know about i don't often consciously set out to write about something sometimes i do but sometimes it's it's a it's something that just happens it's a feeling and it's a it's a word it's a phrase and boom oftentimes they'll just come out almost whole like within 10 15 minutes i don't really think too much and i try to flow and i try to stay on that wave it's almost like catching a tiger's tail and sometimes i can go for a distance sometimes it drops me real quick and it's a terrible poem but and i and i don't really have a lot of control over that although i it, it, that sounds crazy but i do but i don't if it's sort of a balance between my conscious brain and allowing something else to just experience and flow through the universe and when it does that i i, I it clicks and something generally happens and and I don't tend to sit down and, and write every single day. I used to for a time, and now it's just, a, it's, it's almost, I've gotten to the point where I'm riding a wave. It's like surfing. I, I wake up every day and I surf through life. Sometimes that wave is poetry, sometimes it isn't, but it's always the same waves. It's always the same surfing, and I just flow, I think. Yeah. Bro, <laughs> like, it's the same. I'm sorry. I love that metaphor because... If I'm not writing, I'm creating something else. And usually for me, it's like three to six in the morning. So mm -hmm. if I'm not writing a poem, I'm working on fiction. If I'm not working on fiction, I'm writing a political article or I'm working on a graphic, which is something I really dig, you mm -hmm. know? And uh, dude, I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just had like an epiphany. Like, oh <laughs> got me signed? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I would say uh, how I decide what goes in, in, in the book has to do with the 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 spirit around me like i notice when i see a certain thing where i feel like a certain presence 
that let's just say would distract me from putting um my best effort or my my message uh to the community or my audience um you t I tend to deviate but I noticed that when and that's when I started looking for my ancestor I started I saw like, where are you so I, I I talk to the people that I need to talk to not the ones that I don't need to talk to not to say I don't write for everybody I'm writing for a certain population that I feel needs the, the therapy and not to discriminate anyone against reading my books or anything like that. It's just they want to read it and read it. But I I, I, I think of who I want to reach, who I want to talk to. So, and I want to talk to the, the knuckleheads, the homies. And, <laughs> and, and I definitely think about what, how to get my message to them. So, so it's not about saying your best wisdom, proverbs, or whatever. Like it's about reaching out to the audience that you want to establish first. Like who is your audience, and if you decide who that is, you will know how to carry that conversation in your writing. Cool, but but you know, you also okay. No, no, I'm not because we we've had this conversation a lot. Um, when it came time to picking the anchor poem of my spoken word wife. It was already there. You know what I'm saying? I feel like the, the anchor of and even the spoken word wife, that was it. And and um every poem in there has to do with this muse um and this beautiful relationship that you have with the craft. I don't know if you can speak about that just a little bit. Um when in 2015, when when I got diagnosed with schizophrenia, that's what started my illness or whatever you call it, my journey. And and I heard a little voice, a little tiny voice say, ask, ask this girl if, if she's seen my spoken word wife. And I thought it was funny, it was cute, you know, like, but then it became a big problem um, because, like, I felt I had to hide her. Like, I have to hide this woman, like, she's in danger or something. And it evolved, and that's, I ended up many times on the psych ward. This Whatever this muse is, it took me to the psych ward, to the mental hospital. They even tied me down to a bed. And I got injected with all this stuff. And um, I developed like three, four different versions of that poem. And that was the one I, I ran with. I write a lot. I write a lot, you know, but like, and and these, and from the old poetry, the ones that, that I was cutting out, other poems started being born from it. You know, like, like it was like, um, I don't want to say Adam and Eve. I don't want to give you the wrong idea, but like, you know how they say that Eve came out of Adam's rib. So I want to say that these other poems for these other women came out of that the ribs of that poem. And I'm not saying I'm a God, but I'm a creator. You know, I'm a I'm a poet, and I basically it's just a metaphor. You know, like, um, just because whatever doesn't make it on your book doesn't mean that you have to throw it away. That's a new branch that you would cut off and replant it and water it and nourish it into something fully developed. Make sure you reach for the sun. I'm not sure if I answered your, your topic. Oh, you did brother. That was beautiful. Yeah. Oh, you always you. come up with the best wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Yeah. He does. You know, <laughs> like don't, you don't have to be like so profound and wise, but everything he says is profound. <laughs> Yo, did you get that? She said that yeah. everything you say is profound, brother. Don't get an ego now, though. I don't like your people. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe in the chat. Ooh, uh, Nicole says yes, deep and profound. Thank you. Oh, you can get a lot of love in the chat. Somebody says you are creative. You you are creator. That's just for your words. Ah, beautiful. Hey, uh, anybody else? Colin or somebody? Nicole students or Nicole? Or you can ask questions of each other too. Um, I was also going to ask uh, John, like, how do you balance? You said that you were a social worker by trade. How do you balance um, traveling and writing and keeping up with all of that, as well as you know having a life and your professional? Yeah, life? because he's Canadian. Yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> no wonder. It can be difficult, and and. Uh, 
earlier in, in, in my life, it was, it was much more. Um, I have a little bit more time here and there, but not a great deal. What I find, uh, my phone has become my best friend. I used to have books and things and some, but you know, you didn't always have a piece of paper, didn't always have pens or whatever. I always have my phone. So I, I'll just uh, jot things down in, in the middle of my life. I, I, poetry for me and writing for me is just part of my life. It's just part of an extension of me. I don't, often take time out of my life to write it, it it's woven in through just my experience of of being when i to answer the previous question too like picking poems it's a weird thing for a book i tend not to do that oftentimes because they come in streams i write sort of in in streams and have since the beginning mm -hmm. of starting to write poetry to this point there's different ideas and thoughts that I have. I go through different changes to different challenges. There was one book where I, I, I had cancer and I wrote basically not all about cancer, but things of feelings. And it really was all about cancer, but you know, it wasn't poems about cancer, but it was all my feelings at the time. And I tried to just have the world around me um, flow through me. And I, We'll start writing something and I know it's the beginning of a book and then I'll know when the last poem is and I'll just cut it off there, put it aside and I start another process. They don't always make books, mind you, but that's the chunk of time that I've written in about certain things and feelings and, and experiences in my life. And that's a chapter that I just turn over and I start another one and look around and see what's going on, how do I feel. Sometimes that's political, sometimes it's personal, sometimes it's love, sometimes it's all kinds of things. It's outer space. It can be anything. But And, and I, I have a mind that bounces all over the place, a million you know, miles an hour. I have a lot of interests. I, I, you know, I did martial arts for about 35 years, still do, in fact. But it was a way, I think, of me keeping focus because otherwise I'm everywhere under the sun. Um, yeah. As well. But, you know, you're very grounded, though, John. Recently, I was having what I thought was a crisis. And, and you said to me, you know, don't take it so seriously. And that was the best uh, piece of advice. You know, um, it's just just uh, you meditate, too. I, I'm, I'm really I into the meditation thing. I, I do. I a lot of writers that meditate, well, Tom go pre-baby, but now he's producing more, which is fascinating to me, used to meditate for a couple hours a day to sit. Mm -hmm. You know, I meditate walk. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people walk, and probably because I can't sit still for long. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Another, do you also? I walk a lot. Yeah, you walk a lot. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I walk for hours if I have the time. <laughs> yeah, nice. Walking is good, and that's a good point. That, that I do yoga as well. Um, you can be active while meditating as well. It's a different sort of process, but as long as you, I mean. Uh, to the point now where I can just sit and I'm meditating in a chair and, and there's people around, but you know, you just practice it and, and it, it weaves into to what you do, but, but you can meditate anywhere. Some people think it's a, I have to sit down and do this. And that most certainly is one kind of meditating, but there's also yoga. There's, there's things that you, running can be a very meditative state, walking, all those sorts of things. Right. Right. It's very good. How about you, Misa? Um, uh, movement, as long as I'm moving, I'm thinking. Um, it's like you go to a certain location and and imagine there's a like a grid, you know, and that location, thoughts are falling from the sky and it lands on your head just because um, your mind has a certain gravity to attract certain thoughts. You know what I'm saying? So... You know, just if you can't if you can't think of anything to write, just uh, move. You know, and and once you find a spot, it just don't go in the center of the intersection. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> don't, don't wander into the freeway. Just um, find a location. That's what 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 I'll say. You know, and I meditate. I, I I dream. I just think about meditating. I don't really do it. I mean, I lay down and I close my eyes and I start thinking and stuff, but. Um, my, I, I just, I just move. I just, it's, it's when I'm moving, it's when I'm driving, especially when I'm driving, it's when I start thinking about shit to write. But I, I lost my license a long time ago. So, 
But I remember when I was a, I got, I recently got it back. But um, I remember when I was a college student when I was thinking about writing my paper. It was definitely in, I, I, all my thoughts were in the car. I was in movement. I was just moving. Thank you. <laughs> Bro, that's funny. <laughs> How about Riley or Colin or Behan? Anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, uh, was there ever a, a, a like poem that was like very difficult for you like, to write? Okay, so was there a poem that was difficult for you to write? Many. Um <laughs> Many. Uh, often it, it, it can be difficult because the poem isn't quite, there's something clunky somewhere that trips you up. That's one thing. Um, and that happens. And sometimes you just grind that out. Like I said before, sometimes it just flows out. Sometimes you grind it out. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's hard to describe. Yeah, so for me, I feel like, um, yes, many, um, and I feel one more, a pattern of, of difficulty that I used to have was when I have something that is, here's an example from this poem. So I said, like, there's Ice Age and everything in it, which is what came out. But what started this poem that I read today, the first bit, uh, was the fact that predators have their eyes facing uh, forward, right? And pray had the eyes on the side in general, right? So I read that somewhere. I was like, so freaked out by this fact, <laughs> you know? And I thought there's something in this fact that is, I'm going to write about it because humans have this, you know, like forward facing eyes. Um, and I try to write more directly on that. And it just didn't work. The poems are bad. I feel when I when I feel a tug for something, like an image or a word or whatever, and I try to work very directly towards that, I have a lot of trouble. Whereas if I let it sit and like just come out some other way, and sometimes the original image or thought don't even come out in the poem, but I know this is the poem started by that thing. Uh, you know? <laughs> so uh so I have I have a hard time. Often when I have very big feelings, <laughs> you know, and I, I try to write very directly and capture very literally, uh, I, I have a lot of problems. Uh, and then when I let myself go and let it show up where it wants to show up, usually that's how I get out of that yeah. type of problem. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> how about you, Bisan? Um, What was the question again? Have you ever had trouble? Trouble writing poetry, right? Or a poem. Oh, yeah, I have. Um, I had trouble um, organizing my ideas. I had trouble when my when I when my journey was schizophrenia I started and I wasn't making sense. Nobody understood what I was saying. Uh, I wasn't clear, scattered speech. No one cared to read what I had to say simply because I had a rep of, um, I guess, speaking ugly or maybe um, I lost my ability. Oh my, it's, it's, it's like I lost my ability. And then I figured out that um, as long as I, I look for my ancestor, like, and I, 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 I I don't, whatever these things are is going on in my body or whatever is happening as long as I, I avoid that and pray against that um I won't I won't um I won't have a hard time writing to my truest ability because I I guess it's um superstitious in a way to to say if the wrong spirit is in your body um you're gonna write towards that direction whatever is trying to lead you so you just got to, I mean, if you work with God or, or the Buddha, or whatever, like just just make sure you align yourself with the correct spirit. And I saw another question. I wanted to like just yeah, yeah, yeah. You, jump you into that the, question. Can you rethink the question? Can you, well, we can see it. But the question is, what about the critic self-doubt and writer's mm -hmm. block? Any suggestions to combat those pieces? Please. Yeah, I, I wanted to jump into that on. 
uh, I because I think it connects because I was thinking about that question. Um, never hate on your muses. You write something that you don't like, hey, they're gonna look at you like you an appreciative bastard or something like that. Like you, you know, like you have to appreciate where you're getting what you're writing because it's, it's those are the seeds. You know, it's not it may not be polished yet to what it could be, but it's 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 like putting on it's like getting pulling up to a construction site just to leave the material. There's no house and everything looks like a mess, but then you organize it and then you develop it, you work on it. You go oh, you froze up, bro. back and check if if you need some touch ups on the wall. You know, like like don't hate on your music though. Don't 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 hate on yourself. You're hating yourself and that it's like taking a, a step forward and then once you hate your writing, you take two steps back because just don't do it. Appreciate it. Even if it's that long. I appreciate my scattered speech sometimes because it was in the ugliest writing that I possibly got unfriended on Facebook for. I found really beautiful poems, you know, like people unfriended me for the shit that I wrote. And then I went back to it and I found like clever things to say, oh, if I change this verb or add this noun or, you know, change the place, you know, switch it around. I started playing with it and it became a book which impressed Hesu, you know, and I was, and she's an English professor, you know, so I, I must have not, it must have not, it must have been good, you know, so that's all I got to say. Don't hate hey, on your music. I don't, I don't even like writing, <laughs> writing poems, but I like besides writing poems because they're effortless. And he works really hard on his rhythm and rhyme. I don't know if he caught the difference between. I, it was, it's just amazing to me. I don't, I don't have that gift yet. Or, you know, uh, what about you? And what do you do with this self-doubt writer? Self black <laughs> yes. All the demons that lie to you. I love, I love like all this, this thing about um, the way you put it with the, don't hate on your muses. <laughs> I think my version of it is be very kind to yourself um, and take care of yourself as you're writing. Um, but also I felt that over time I discovered my rhythms um, and John had mentioned not writing every day and taking notes scattered through life. Early on, I didn't know I had rhythms and things got busy and you read people saying, you have to wake up at 5 a.m. and write every day. Um, and then you feel bad if you don't or something. Uh, over time, I discovered that that is not at all necessary for me. <laughs> and I discovered also that I will have times when I'm not gonna write and that's just gonna happen. But because it happened many times, I don't feel like, oh, I'm never gonna write again anymore, <laughs> you know? But I do feel like that it helps to take notes whenever you see something interesting. So instead of approaching it as I'm writing a poem, you approach in the in the sort of dry spell situation, right? Instead of saying, I'm writing a poem today. No, you just, if there's a sentence or an image that comes to you, you write them down as notes during this this uh, dry spells with no pressure. Uh, and you let them to be long, but just let yourself accumulate notes and also just accumulate experience of living yep. and it, it will yeah. come back, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I find too when I'm when I'm blocked. So uh, I, I'm usually in denial about something. I'm out of the rhythm of my life. Something isn't quite going in my unconscious well, and I don't always know what that is. But I know I'm blocked. I know I'm out of phase. I will just do something else um, until it comes back. If it comes back, and if it doesn't, I don't worry too much about it. I figure it will. But if it doesn't, I'm okay with that too because you know it is what it is kind of thing so i try not to stress and fret too much about it um and and just try to do something else as it comes um that rhythm is important too you know it, it, you know the rhythm of your life you know when you wake up and you just feel that you're flowing through existence and it's working you know those days when you're not you can write well on both of those days but Sometimes you can't with with either of them. Sometimes things are going great and you're busy and you just want to go off and your brain isn't wanting to sit down and write. Sometimes it's the opposite. You know, you're going through too much. The feelings are very intense 
and you don't really feel like sitting down and writing. But if you just distract yourself with your life and stay within, try to get in the rhythm of your life, it will come at some point. It might be a month, it might be a week, it might be an hour. It could be years, but it will come if, if it's meant to come. I just try not to worry about it. And the self-doubt part, I, I have it all the time, pretty much. I, you know, some things I think I, I write, okay, that's really good. Some things not so much. I. You know, I probably quit writing every three weeks or so, two weeks. And, and I think it's a way, and I mean, that, that sounds silly, but I, I really do think it's an unconscious way of me resetting my my expectations, my reality, and just saying, you know what, I'm done with this. I'm probably never going to write again. I've quit. And that make, that gives me relief because I think it just allows me to breathe a little bit. And and then a week later, or two days later, there's something pops out and I'm like, oh, here we go again. That, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I wouldn't be horribly disappointed if it didn't come back because it, it's painful to do sometimes, right? But it's not something I choose to do often. It's something that grabs me and makes me do it. It's, that's more what it's like for me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, listen, this has been beautiful. And I think we can end on that positive note. Sorry, I lost track of time, y'all. Uh, this has been such a fruitful conversation. This has been amazing. And um, uh, yeah, going back to basics is important. I want to thank uh, everybody. And, you know, I say this and I say this with true love and intention. This is, think of this as your second home. Love to have you back again. And, uh, you know, we'll keep in touch, definitely. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you, students. It's been amazing. I've had a really great time. And thank you, Nicole. I see you, sister. Thank you for bringing your students. I am live streaming this. You can catch other events and radical books and activists on YouTube. I don't know how this recording is going to be because the Zoom was a little wonky, but thank you, thank you, thank you. And, and keep writing, y'all. Don't stop, no matter what. Yeah, keep, it, keep going. All right. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, sister. Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, what? Balloons. <laughs>